In this video, we're going to take a look at the items that you received in your kit and we're going to kind of go through and uh, talk about what they're used for, what they're called, and um, we're going to talk about a little bit about how to use the balance and we're going to take a look at the chemicals that you received. Okay, so we're going to start in with the kit with the beaker set. So the beaker set has several different beakers in it. Um, it starts all the way with the smallest one that's um, about 50 mils uh, in size all the way up to the largest one, which is uh, one liter. Now, the reason for the beaker set, uh, the beakers themselves are good for just holding liquid solutions, um, running reactions, things like that. So when we're using the beakers, we're generally speaking going to want to be um, using these just for containment. So they're see-through, which is nice because then we can see if a reaction is taking place or if color change is happening. And they are graduated, but these graduations are not very accurate. So we're not going to be using these to measure actual volume. Um, so you're not going to measure out 50 or 40 mils of a liquid with that. We're going to use the graduated cylinders to measure out volume. So these are useful just as kind of a utility thing to, to contain things. For example, if you needed to stir a solution or something like that, you could put a solution in here and stir it. And another good thing that they're really useful for is they have these very nice pour spouts, which allows you to transfer um, a solution into uh, an Erlenmeyer flask, for example, or into one of your graduated cylinders. Okay, so now what we are going to use to measure volume is the uh, graduated cylinders. So the graduated cylinders are um, gradu have these nice graduations on them, and we're going to just talk about how these are used to measure volume. So the large one, the large graduated cylinder, has a total volume of 50 mils with one milliliter increments. So each one of these small marks represents one milliliter, and then the larger marks represent five and 10 milliliter increments. So the best that we can do with this graduated cylinder would be to estimate in between two of these marks. So we could measure, for example, 41, and then uh, look at the bottom of the meniscus and see where that is between 41 and 42 mils and guess that it's 41.2, for example, if it were about two tenths of the way up. Remember, when you're measuring that, you want to keep these at eye level to prevent parallax. So we're going to measure the bottom of the meniscus with a flat, and we're going to have our eye at the same level as the graduations. Now, the smaller graduated cylinder, it has a maximum volume of 10 mils, and this one has um, 0 0.1 ml increments. So um, for this one, we can measure down to 2.1 and then estimate between 2.1 and 2.2. Uh, so we can get two decimal places out of that graduated cylinder. The only limitation is that it has slightly smaller volume. So the next thing is the Erlenmeyer flasks. Um, and these are actually made of glass. Uh, and the reason why we used, made the, make, the reason why we bought these out of glass is because you can really see through them very nicely. Um, so when we're running a reaction that has a color change, you're going to really be able to see the color exactly as it would appear without any distortion from the plastic. So that's why we got glass ones. Um, again, these ones are graduated, but they're not graduated um, accurately, so we're not going to use these to measure volume. Um, but uh, a great thing about Erlenmeyer flask is that because of the conical nature, you can swirl a, a solution without it sort of spilling all over the place. So that's why we use um, Erlenmeyer flask, so you can see through them. Okay, so the next thing is the test tube rack, which looks like this. And we have um, a kit with a bunch of test tubes in it, so that's going to come in a separate bag. And then, of course, the test tubes will go into the test tube rack and um, will sit like this. And then we can observe the reaction that's taking place inside the test tube without having to necessarily hold the test tube. So if we put a little bit of solid in here and we add a little bit of liquid on top, we can observe the reaction without um, having to actually be physically holding the test tube. So that's why we have the test tube rack. Another nice thing about the test tube rack is when you're done and you want to rinse out the test tubes, you can um, put them vertically like this and then the water will kind of drain out. Um, these ones are a little bit snug so that that might not work so great. But for example, if you wanted to have some backup test tubes, you could have your test tubes that are in the hole, in the test tube holes, and then you could have a backup behind it in case you wanted to, you know, swap this one out and need a fresh one for the next reaction or something like that. So that's the test tube rack. Okay, so the next uh, thing that we have is the um, the 60 milliliter syringe, 
And the 60 milliliter syringe is, uh, is going to be used basically in place of a burette. So it's got this little plastic uh, thing that we can pull out and that's just to, um, that's just to protect the, the end. We're going to be using this in place of a burette. Uh, this is graduated, so you can um, use these graduations to me measure volume. They're accurate, but not super accurate. Um, this is going to give us uh, to the one decimal point, just like the 50 mil graduated cylinder. It's similar in that sense. Uh, when we use this for a titration, though, we're actually going to be uh, taking the mass of the solution. So we're going to be um, weighing this and weighing the solution inside of it as we go through the titration. And that's how we're going to measure and use density to measure volume more accurately. We're going to get more significant figures out of it. But this is this is a way of delivering um, volume um, where you can actually, you know, kind of get some approximate volumes measured as you deliver it, basically as you push it into to your solution. Uh, the other thing we have is a funnel. Um, this is pretty self-explanatory. You might use the funnel to transfer liquid into the graduated cylinder. Or something else. Funnels are really helpful because it allows you to, like I said, transfer with that with having a much wider opening. So that's why we have the funnel. Uh, and then we have the thermometer. Now the thermometer is another uh, glass component. Um, this could potentially break, so we have to be careful with it. Uh, this particular thermometer goes from minus 10 degrees Celsius all the way up to 150 degrees Celsius. We'll never be going that high. But this will allow you to um, measure temperature. And we just want to be careful with this thermometer because it, uh, it's glass and it can break. So when you're, when you're not using it, make sure you keep leave it in this little plastic keeper thing. Uh, we also have pH paper. Um, and you'll notice when you open up the pH paper, there's going to be a scale that's colored. Uh, and that will tell you what the different um, pHs are. And then um, there'll be the individual pH papers, which you can rip off and uh, use. The next thing is the stirring rod. Uh, it's just a piece of plastic that you can use to stir things in solution. And then uh, very important, we have the plastic pipettes. So these are used to measure, um, these are used to transfer solutions from one to another. We're going to use these to, to add dropwise um, things like acetic acid. They are graduated, but this is very approximate. So if I if we say to use this to you know pull up about one mil, you can use it to pull up to the one mil mark, and then um, you'll know that you have approximately one mil of volume. Um, so that's what the pipettes are used for, and they're really good at adding things dropwise, so you can go slow and control. The next thing we're going to look at is the balance. Uh, so when you get your balance, it's going to come in a nice box. They're going to, it's going to come with batteries, um, which is nice. So we don't have to plug this in or anything. It's very portable. And you can uh, set this up quickly. You just put the batteries in the back and then it comes. It has this nice plastic cover, which we're going to use to keep stuff off of the pan. Um, it also comes with this plastic pan, which we'll use when we're weighing out solids, um, just to protect the balance a little bit more. Now, when you turn it on for the first time, uh, it's going to come on. It's going to say hello, which is kind of nice, I thought. And for the very first time, it didn't uh, say 0, 0.00 for me. What I had to do is I had to push the tear button. And what that does is that tells the system zero out. So that's what the tear button is for. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more in a second. So let's just say we wanted to measure an object. Like, let's say we wanted to measure the mass of our graduated cylinder. We would, what we would do is we would turn the balance on. We would hit tear, make sure that it was reading grams. The little G. Then we would put it on and we would let it measure. So this is giving me 31.00 grams um, for the graduated cylinder. Now, even though it says 31.00, we're going to record all of those significant figures because this could have been 31.05. It just so happens that this is 31.00. So when you write this number down with significant figures, you're going to write down 31.00 um, or 0 0.50 or 0 0.52, whatever it is. Okay, so that's how you would weigh out just an object that was that you wanted to know the mass of. Now, normally though, we're gonna want to we're gonna be weighing out powders, or we're gonna want to be weighing out liquids, or something like that. So when you weigh out a powder, we're gonna put our little pan on top, and then that's gonna give us a little bit of protection in case we spill something. And then we're probably also gonna want to weigh it into something that's gonna allow us to transfer whatever it is that we have to weigh. So depending on the kit that we decide to go with for the fall, um, 
depending on how things go over the summer, your kit may contain these foil pans, or we may use um, we may use little small cuts of printer paper uh, rather than these pans. But either way, um, you're going to have to weigh into something. So uh, once you have all this on, you can see that the balance is giving us a mass of about 33.81, 82, 80. And you'll, you'll notice that it's kind of bouncing around a little bit, and that's because I have my hand right near it. When you have your hand there, it's going to kind of get messed up. If, when I take my hand away and I stop talking for a second, it's going to stabilize to a mass. So um, that, that's what we're going to do. You want to just put it, everything on, let it stabilize. Now, we, when we want to weigh out something, if we want to get a mass of something, but we don't want to include all this other stuff in it, we can simply hit the tear button. And um, again, I'm going to take my hand away and let it zero. And you might have to hit it one or two times to get it to fully zero, but there it goes. So now, now it's reading 0, 0.000. So all of the mass that was on top of here is not going to be counted. And whatever we add in using our spatula um, onto this, we're just going to be able to read off the mass directly. So if I asked you to weigh out five grams of sodium carbonate or something like that, or one gram of sodium carbonate, uh, you can put everything on, set it up like this, hit the tear button, and then weigh your sodium carbonate in. So when you take this off, when you take all this off, you're just going to take that off. You're going to see it has a negative value, and you're just going to hit the tear button to bring it back to zero. Or in this case, it's close to zero. We're going to have to give it a second to measure out, but then we hit zero, and it, it should go back to zero. There we go. So oh, we got it back to zero. So that's how you use the balance. Um, and that component of the kit. Okay, so the last part of this video is going to focus on the chemical, com the chemical components that you received and how we're going to store them and what are some of the things that we have to think about when we're working with chemicals. So first and foremost, um, the kit that you received is going to have safety glasses. You're going to want to wear those safety glasses whenever you whenever you start the ex from the minute you start the experiment to the minute you complete the experiment and are finished cleaning up. You're going to want to have safety glasses on. Now, none of the chemicals that we're giving you are particularly hazardous, um, but they, they can, if they get into your eye, cause eye irritation. And I mean, the same is true, like just for even common table salt. So even if you just have regular old table salt, if that were to get into your eye, that would cause irritation. So that's something to think about when you're doing these experiments. So let's take a look at the different chemical compounds we have and which ones are um, what we need to think about when we're working with them. So the first one we have is magnesium sulfate. Another, another name for magnesium sulfate is Epsom salts. Uh, typically, these can be used to be put into baths or into, you know, um, that you dissolve this in like bath water to, to have a little bit of um, salt in the water. Um, that's what they use Epsom salts for. We're obviously not going to use these Epsom salts for that, but um, we are going to use, th th so these are an equivalent household product to e Epsom salts. And it's, these are about as safe as sodium chloride, so uh, not something you're going to want to get in your eye, not something you're going to want to eat or drink. Um, you should never eat or drink any of these chemicals, um, but uh, about as safe as, as table salt. Okay, so the next one is uh, the sodium carbonate. This is very similar to uh, household baking soda. It has this very similar chemistry to household baking soda. And... Um, this one, just like regular old household baking soda, it can be a bit of an eye irritant. So you're going to want to, if you get this uh, in your eye, that would be a bad thing. So you're going to want to wear your safety glasses as you're, as you're working with this. But very similar to household baking soda. The next one is a starch solution, is, is a soluble starch. Uh, this is very similar to the starch that you would put into laundry to, you know, make things um, not have wrinkles. Um, you can buy over-the-counter laundry starch, and this is the same basic product. The only difference is that the starch that we bought is water-soluble, which makes it a little easier to work with. Uh, and then the next one is ascorbic acid, which is uh, this one. Ascorbic acid is the same thing as vitamin C, which you would find in um, orange juice. So no real hazards there, but because it's a, uh, a bit of a weak acid, um, it's not something that you would want to get into your eye directly because it's a bit of an irritating powder. So safety glasses for that one. Now the last two are a little bit more, um, require a little bit more consideration. So uh, potassium iodide is a compound that we're going to use. This uh, compound is 
uh, has the potassium cation, which is a um, the same thing as the potassium of potassium chloride, and then it has the iodide anion. Uh, this one is not something that you want to ingest, so um, not something that you're going to want to eat uh, or drink. But um, when you're working with potassium iodide, you want to wear your safety glasses because, again, it's an eye irritant. And um, for potassium iodide, if you get it on your skin, this is a, this is one where you're going to want to just wash your hands with a little bit of soap and water. Um, so if you spill any on your skin or you get the potassium iodide solution on your skin, just wash your hands with a little bit of soap and water and that, that will get rid of it. If you spill the potassium iodide or if you spill any of these compounds, um, but the potassium iodide especially, the best way to get that up is to use a wet paper towel to kind of pick up any of the spilled solid and then uh, just wipe with a wet paper towel to get up any residue. The last one is hydrogen peroxide. Uh, this one is a bit of a, this one can be a bit of an irritant, just like the hydrogen peroxide that you would buy over the counter. Um, the one that you have in your kit is slightly more concentrated. It's 30% hydrogen peroxide. And the reason for that is so that we could, we're, what we're gonna be, when we're working with this, we're gonna be diluting it down to 5%. But the 30% is, tends to work a little bit better when you dilute um, than to just buy the 5% straight off. So uh, when you're working with this, you're gonna wanna make sure that you don't, um, if you spill it, that you wipe it up with a little bit of extra water uh, to get clean it up. And you're gonna wanna wear your safety glasses while you're working with it. If you get it on your hands or your skin, just make sure that you wash your hands with uh, soap and water and that will take care of it. Okay, so those are the chemicals. The best way to store the chemicals is in a uh, plastic container. Um, I recommend something with a top, kind of like this. Uh, so you put everything in just to, to kind of keep it. And then what's important is uh, just make sure that you keep this container with the chemicals in sort of a, a, a above, you know, above hand level so that um, it's not accessible from children or pets. Um, this is not something you would want chil uh, young children or pets getting into um, for safety reasons. So just like you would put a cleaning a, like a bleach cleaner or something like that, you'd put that on a high up shelf or in a locked cabinet. The same thing goes for this. Uh, you wanna basically have control over who accesses this so that you only have access to it. Not because these things are particularly unsafe, but just so that you know um, the uh, children or pets are not getting access to things they shouldn't have access to. So that, and then this will keep it all together. Now for the rest of the equipment, uh, the beakers and the glassware, I recommend keeping everything in the original box that you received it in, just so that you, everything is organized and that way you're not, you don't lose it, anything. Uh, like the glass components, you may wanna put in, um, you may wanna wrap them with the original paper they came in just so that they don't cling together and break. But um, other than that, the main thing is just keeping everything organized and keeping it all together. So if anybody has any questions, um, feel free to ask your section instructors regarding the kit or how to use the kit or if, if you had any issues with your kit. And, um, and good luck, this, this, should, this should get you through all of the at-home experiments for the semester.